Today we're going to have a look at the exponential form of a complex number. Now this little pearl of mathematics is something we introduced last lesson, but you might recall that we actually did sort of an informal proof and um, it's kind of what we refer to as a bit hand wavy. There were some bits where it was kind of like, oh, uh, just trust me and um, you'll see why this is going to make sense in the end. But if you're an inquisitive person, you might be thinking, hmm, I'm not 100% sure or 100% convinced that all of the logic in the argument was uh, completely watertight. Tire, and that's because it was an informal proof. We still ended at the right result, but it was required a little bit of trust in order to get to the end of it. What I'm going to do today is what we call a rigorous proof uh, that will land us on the exponential form of a complex number as you've already encountered. But to do that, uh, we're going to have to go this in long form. So that's why we're going to take our time through here and you can see I've got this outline that we're going to march through. For starters, I'm going to establish there is some knowledge that you need to come into uh, this proof. There's some foundational stuff we're going to build upon. And this is one of the best things about mathematics. Things don't come out of thin air. We take theorems and properties and characteristics of, of numbers and shapes and we, we develop those um, slowly over time like a big pyramid and then we can reach these really amazing heights by building on some very strong foundations. So I'm going to make sure we cover like what things do you need to know to understand this proof fully. Uh, I'm going to introduce a new idea to you, uh, something which is strictly speaking not something you have to know about, but it's a very handy idea um, called a field, and we're going to that's going to lead into the formal proof of Euler's formula. Um, that's what we did informally last time. Uh, point three, that formal proof is going to take the bulk of our time and probably the bulk of your mental effort. And then finally, we're going to conclude. I really should have called that conclusion, but I wanted everything to start with an F, so I just called it finish. All right. So if you're ready to go and uh, you know, you've got, got a glass of water, maybe something to eat there, then uh, buckle in and we're going to have a go. So to start with foundational knowledge. There are three key ideas that you really need to have down pat in order to understand everything here. So the first one, which um, you might recall from last time when we had a look at the informal proof, is you need to know how to differentiate the basic trigonometric functions. So those being uh, sine x and cos x. Uh, put that down here. Uh, now we're going to need that. I'm going to kind of assume that uh, the results for those, namely that the derivative of sine x it becomes cos x, and the derivative of cos x becomes negative sine x. Maybe I put those in other colors just so you see that they're not actually just the same thing. Uh, we are going to. I'm just going to assume them as as taken results. Uh, if you want, um, I'll talk about later. If you're some, no, you're not up to that yet, that's okay. Um, we'll talk about how you can prove that for yourself. The second thing, which you have absolutely covered in some detail, but you're going to keep on doing in the next 12 months of the course, uh, is the chain rule or the function of a function rule. So this, again, is something I'm going to be using um, quite a lot. And because I'm going to be using it a lot, you have to be uh, not just something like you, that you know, but you have to be uh, fluent in it. You have to be able to see, oh, I see where the function is on the outside, I see where the function is on the inside, and then deal with them quite comfortably. Uh, and then the newest idea that's involved in this that we're going to rely on uh, is something called integration, uh, which is for the intents and purposes of what going, we're going to do today, it's the opposite of differentiation. So um, sometimes uh, it's analogous to this process called anti-differentiation. They are slightly different. Um, you'll discover why a little bit later on, uh, but that's something we're going to do right toward the end of the proof. Now, one of the tricky things about this is that like you, you may be thinking, why am I using some bits and pieces of mathematics that I am familiar with, some I'm less familiar with now, uh, so that we can use this result? Well, the answer is because you're studying mathematics advanced, extension one, extension two, and they are strictly speaking separate courses with separate syllabuses. However, um, for me, one of the most beautiful things about them is how nicely they interweave. They're, they're connected syllabuses, connected curriculums, connected stories as it were. So they kind of overlap and touch each other. And the order in which you learn them, um, because they all interact with each other and interface, um, can complicate things sometimes. So I'm going to assure you that by the end of the course, you will have met all of these ideas and you'll be very comfortable with them. At least that's the goal. Um, however, in the meantime, if you're like, well, I'm not there yet and I still don't really get this, or maybe you're learning this at a different point and you just want to revise these ideas so this proof makes sense to you, then I've got a bunch videos about all of these. So when it comes to differentiating the trigonometric functions, sine, cos, we don't need tan for this but it just sort of comes along for the ride. 
you can have a look at my videos on the calculus of trig functions. For the chain rule, um, that's something which you've been using for a little while, but only probably in polynomials, depending on where you are in the course at the moment. So the basic idea though, it applies to, um, or you probably have done exponential functions as well, maybe logs, um, but we're gonna be using it with trigonometric functions. Um, so you can have a look at those. And then for integration, um, it is a massive big idea. So if you wanna have a look at those, again, uh, plenty of videos about that, but you will discover in the next few uh, weeks and months, okay? So this is the foundational knowledge. This is what you've got to have understood. I will point out because um, sort of the newest idea to you is this uh, integration, this anti-differentiation idea. When we get to it in the course of this proof, um, I will sort of try to explain it in a way that even if you don't have any of the big theory, like you haven't watched these videos or you haven't learned it um, before, um, you will still be able to follow along. We'll base it on our understanding of just regular differentiation, okay? So that was point one, foundational knowledge. Let's now introduce this idea, what we call a field. Now, what do I mean by fields? Uh, I'm not talking about grassy fields. I'm talking actually about a kind of mathematical object that you already know about, you just haven't called them fields. Uh, let me just delete this so I can get them out of the way. When we started in, in the topic of complex numbers, we talked about the fact that there are different kinds of numbers, um, and we would call these, you know, sets, the set of natural numbers or counting numbers, right? Um, this is, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Um, some people include zero in that, but it doesn't matter all that much. And uh, then we quickly said, you know, from natural numbers, you can develop all kinds of other numbers. For example, uh, we say there's the integers, right? Uh, we extend this um, to include the, the negative numbers, right? So not only do you have one, two, three, and so on, and zero, um, but you also have going in the opposite direction. So you've got negative one, negative two, and so on. Now, the important thing that I want to get to you in this idea of fields is that um, fields are these kinds of collections of, of numbers and the important thing about them is that you know, particular fields will sort of uh, lead you out into other fields. If you like, they're kind of connected, right? So what I mean by that is the field of natural numbers, okay, one, two, three, and, and so on, it, uh, it, uh, sort of, I was going to say natural, a natural consequence of the natural numbers is that you end up with the integers if you just think about regular operations like uh, subtraction for example. Um, if you only have addition of natural numbers then you can only, if you add up any two or three or however many natural numbers you like, you'll get another natural number. But as soon as you allow subtraction you sort of break into the field of integers, right? Just think about this. Um, if you did three take away one, you'd still be in the natural number field, you'd get two. But as soon as you do one take away three, that, the answer to that uh, expression doesn't have a solution within the natural number field. You're like, that's, that's why young children would say you can't do one take away three because their only concept for, um, for, for subtraction is taking a, uh, a smaller number away from a bigger number. But once you do the reverse, you're like, oh, I need other numbers to explain what's going on here. So we would say negative two, right? So um, what this means is that the field of natural numbers is what we call open. Um, it, it sort of opens out into other fields like, like the field of integers, right? And um, th it sort of opens out into other fields as well. Like for example, this Q, you might remember, uh, this stands for the rational numbers. And uh, the rational numbers are what come from not addition or subtraction, but from division. So um, let me just extend this a little further. If I go back to the natural numbers, let's go five, six, That'll, that might do me for now. Um, if I do six divided by three, um, I will still stay within the field of natural numbers, right? Uh, you just get two. But if I do six divided by five, then none of these is the answer to that question. So six divided by five, um, it becomes a rational number, it's in a different field. So you can see the natural numbers open out into here um, and you can keep on going, right? When you start thinking about, um, I've actually missed one here, uh, after the rational numbers, you could talk about, say, the irrational numbers. So pop one over the top there. So the irrational numbers, if we start thinking about other operations, right? If we start thinking about not just addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, division, uh, if we start to think about um, square roots, for example, which really come from uh, using these operations and, and writing equations, right? So if I wrote an equation like x squared uh, minus four equals zero, this equation here, I actually should put it up over here, um, puts me in the integer number field here, right? Because the solutions would be plus or minus two. But if I wrote an equation like this, x squared minus five, 
I'm still using the same familiar tools, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponentiation. That's what gives me this index up here. But now, um, my answers to this are not going to be natural. They're not going to be integers. They're not going to be rational. They're going to be, you're going to get plus or minus the square root of five here. So you get an irrational number, right? So you can see these fields, they keep on opening out, right? Um, you can then go to the real numbers. Uh, you can go even broader than this. So the whole idea here is that these fields here are all open, right? From these fields, you can get into other fields. But, and this is what's kind of special about complex numbers, um, even though there are other kinds of numbers, the field of complex numbers is what we call, and I'll put this in another color just to highlight it, right? It's what we call algebraically closed. It's not open. Um, using the tools of algebra, the operations that I was just naming before within arithmetic, um, using those tools, you, you can't get from the complex numbers to other kinds of numbers. It's a closed field. It's, it's like you're sort of uh, fenced in, right? No matter what ways you combine, uh, you know, the real and imaginary parts, you can write some weird and wacky equations like this. You can use limits. You can use all kinds of things. You'll never escape. Um, the field of complex numbers is algebraically closed.